had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Bruce Hoffman a year or two ago, where we talked about multi layers of chronic illness and how sometimes it takes a multitude of levers to get to root cause healing. It was a complex conversation where some people learn new ideas and new levers to pull to get to root cause healing. And I have Dr. Bruce Hoffman back on to talk specifically about MCAS, histamines, and why we have sensitivities to maybe food and other environmental toxins that then make us not feel well. Hey guys, my name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and that often starts with the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. Today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Bruce Hoffman. We start the conversation with MCAS and histamines, what that really means, what the differences are all mediators from MCAS really just histamines. Is it genetics? Is it sulfur? Is it methylation? We talk about a lot of these nuances, but that inevitably gets us to the multifactorial causes of what may cause root cause or chronic illness. We talk about the cell danger response, how sometimes our body is just trying to protect ourselves and starts to shut down and just focuses on surviving another day. We talk about emotional stuff and how families and the relationship of family roles and trauma play a role in how our then physical body reacts to the world and it has its immune system being strong or not. And we talk a lot about these nuances and you'll see in this conversation that it's not a simple answer of do this and you will heal, do this and you'll heal. But there are many different levers to pull, but there are certain foundational ones, including diet and having yourself eat a well, I think a carnivore meat only diet and lower the histamine bucket or the cast bucket to then start having the immune system become stronger and be able to be more vigilant for other things that may be affecting the body. This conversation is a little complex, but I hope it gives you insight into what may be also an issue of why you're not healing fully. We talk a lot about trauma and why our team even created a mind body group and the importance of it, how there are so many layers and factors into why you might not be healing with just a diet or just an environmental change or just a cleaning of your home or getting rid of mold or taking a Lyme protocol or reducing with MCAS or histamine medications. Sometimes it's just the way that you're perceiving the world that can affect you. There's a graphic that I wanted to bring up with Dr. Hoffman that I forgot to, but it was written by or drawn by after school and I'll link to him in the show notes, but it's a, pic a picture of a bee and one person sees all these happy imagining honey and all these happy cells or happy messengers in the body. And then the other person looks distraught and scared that it may get stung and then be hospitalized. And you see the different outcomes. And in the body, you see how these two different people react to one event or not event, but an event or something that happens in front of them in their life, that their response then completely changes or their view of the response completely changes their outcome in a physical and mental point of view. And that's how if we have 60,000 thoughts a day, if 60,000 of them are more negative or looking at the B as I'm going to be in the hospital versus it may bring me honey and sweetness, then you could see how then it will impact our mental health and our immune system and our digestive function, which we also talk about how that all gets um, interacted in this conversation. I hope you guys enjoy this information. I would take notes because he brings up a lot of different facets to look into to help you get closer to root cause healing. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Hoffman. It's so nice to have you back. I know last time we talked about the multiple layers of chronic illness, how we need to support the mind, the body, the environment and diet and all the other things. So I will link to our old um, interview. But in this specific interview, I wanted to talk a lot more in detail about histamines MCAS and, you know, why, why do some people just have an immune response to food or environment compared to others? And before we get into it, if we could have you introduce yourself. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Bruce Hoffman. I'm in Calgary, uh, Canada from South Africa, and I have run a clinic that uh, treats complex, chronic complex multi-system multi-symptom illness. 
mostly along the lines of uh, micelle activation, mold exposure, uh, POTS, Ellos Danlos hypermobility. Just people who just generally don't feel very well, and there's no there's no diagnostic way that they can sort it out in the, the traditional training that I received at med school, which is single organ, single drug kind of approach. Because when you have this chronic complex illness, it's multi system, and there's no there's no real diagnosis as such. It's just a, a multitude of symptoms with different pathophysiological processes that usually don't get determined under the traditional medical workup. So right. they end up being very frustrated and then often you know, suffer the consequences of multiple emergency room admissions and multiple, oh, you know, it's all in your head and you're just anxious and get on an SSR. You know, they, they go through hell and um, they feel very invalidated, which often reactivates their early childhood experiences of being invalidated by their parents. Mm -hmm. And so it's a whole cascade of uh, pathophysiological, biochemical, emotional, mental processes that just never get seen and heard. So we do our best to, you know, try and work out the multiple layers and levels that need to be looked at. And one of them is the whole muscle activation issue, which is very dominant and very poorly understood in traditional medicine. Right. And that's why I wanted to have you on. Um, you work with some of our clientele and you're helping them get better. And they are very, very complex cases. So thank you for that, first of all. Sure. Um, thank you. In terms of MCAS, so in SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is uh, where your immune system has gone awry, the innate immune system is not communicating with the active side or the adaptive side. Uh -huh. There are some times where it's a genetic thing. It's not just a mast cell thing uh, where it might just be that your genes have turned on because of some type of invader. That might even sound confusing to the people that are listening right now. So what yeah. is, I'm just curious, there are so many different immune mediators, but we focus or hyper-focus on histamines. But like you said last time, there's many. So what is histamines? And then are all histamines equals, therefore severe ones is MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome. And if it's not, if you can just sort of help us understand the lay of the land, because I yeah. think everyone thinks some people have histamines and then the severe version is MCAS, but it's not always. No, it's not like that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's, okay. it's, it's a whole complex a system of interlocking bits and pieces. So just if I can try and... I uh, go back to some very um, elementary principles that I yes, use please. with patients. So when Robert Naveau came out with his theory of the cell danger response, and then Paul Jez came out with his work with po polyvagal theory, mm -hmm. and then Richie Shoemaker with SIRS, and then Jack Cruz with, you know, the whole light, the physics of light, yeah, as you can see. Got... <laughs> um, when you start to work in that complexity, um, we, what we realize is that when a person gets chronically exposed to stresses, no matter what they may be, whether they be mold or chemical toxins or sulfites or uh, histamine-containing foods or early neglect trauma or abuse trauma or you name it, just life. When life downloads in excess of the capacity of the individual to self-regulate and deal with it biochemically and mentally, the entire organism goes into Porges's polyvagal shutdown right. and into the correlative biochemical of the cell danger response. And the cell danger response is a response that occurs when your toxic load gets excessive and then it triggers voltage change in cell membranes and changes the phospholipid coating of the outer mitochondrial and cell. And then the cell then goes into a, a destructive mode, releases its contents, particularly ATP and the, and the DNA of the cell. That then comes out and be, to try and protect other cells and tell them, hey, shut down, shut down, you're in danger. And then there's this cascading inflammatory response that occurs, which then triggers part of the innate immune system, of which mast cells are huge, to release another whole cascade of inflammatory mediators, which then perpetuate the cell danger response. And people get stuck in this pro-inflammatory cycle that they can't get out of. Right. 
And uh, so mast cells in and of themselves are primitive white cells, 1% of the um, white cell makeup. And they sit at all the cutaneous surfaces of the body. And they release up to 1,000 mediators of inflammation, not just histamine. Histamine is one. And so histamine is associated with, you know, traditionally the the rhinitis and the asthma and the ectopic eczemas. But there are other mediators of inflammation like proteases. For instance, proteases are proteins and tryptases, which break down connective tissue, which makes people with hypermobility far more sensitive to their toxic load. There are prostaglandins, which are pro-inflammatory, and leukotrienes, which are pro-inflammatory, and heparins, which cause bleeding. So there's this whole cascade of potential mediators, which cause a whole array of symptoms all over the map. If you look at what symptoms can be uh, enunciated through a, a mast cell patient, there's like, I mean, 200, 300 symptoms and about 30, 20 different uh, traditional diagnoses that could fall under the rubric of mast cell activation. Yeah, so it's a very complex issue, and and there's no real roadmap that's acceptable as to how to diagnose it. You know, you've got the the traditional immunologists and who work with systemic mastocytosis, mm -hmm. which is where you get an increased number of mast cells, and you've got to do something. You've got to get high tryptase levels, you've got to see these spindlings when you do the histopathology, you look for kit mutations. That's the traditional systemic mastocytosis. I've seen like three cases in my whole career. They do exist, okay. and you treat, them, you treat them very similarly. Then you've got, you know, you've got systemic mastocytosis. Then you've got within the world of um, um, mast cell activation syndrome, you've got consensus one and consensus two. You got an old school of people who put forward these hypotheses of how to diagnosis, and they've really insisted on that tryptase level being high or low. And when you get exposed and you've got symptoms, the tryptase level to increase by 1.2 times over baseline. Afrin and the group I belong to, we've sort of we developed our own consensus two statement, which says no, that's not necessarily true. That tryptase, we very seldom find tryptase being elevated, by the way. Okay. It's more other things like chromogranin A and uh, histamine and histamine and N-methyl histamine, which are breakdown products of histamine. You see those. But we use the phase, we use two major criteria. We One major criteria, a set of symptoms that could possibly be my cell activation. And there's many. So I have a questionnaire, tick, 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 tick. And if you've got a whole lot of them, then we start thinking of it. And then we do, uh, there's a minor criteria. And the minor criteria are, do you have one or two labs that could point us in the right direction? And do you respond to mast cell blockers? If you fulfill those criteria, we work with the diagnosis. We try and get a histopathology a biopsy of the GI tract to see if there's any, when they stay in the mast cells with CD117 stain, to see if there's increased mast cells in the GI pathology, particularly in the duodenum. But every time we've got to get pathologists to restain because they never stain for it. You have to write back to them and say, hey, I see that you wrote there's no uh, celiac disease and there's no lymphocytic colitis, but how many mast cells do you see? So then they'll write back and say, oh, we saw a normal number of mast cells. Well, what's your normal? Oh, 80. No, that's not normal. We take 19 numbers of mast cells uh, in a 40 times um, magnification under high-powered field as criteria for excessive mast cell activation in a biopsy specimen from the GI tract. It sounds like the cell danger response is triggers this, whether it's histamines or any of the mediators or mast cell. Um, if we were to find, and maybe that's the, the hard thing, um, find the root cause of what's causing the cell danger, the cell to even say, oh, I see that we're at a point of danger. Let's all close shop. So at least we can survive. Yeah. My understanding is that most MCAS is not root cause, but it's the symptom of whatever Maybe. triggered. Yeah, people come in and say, I want you to diagnose and treat my MCAS. It's my root cause. It's not. It's secondary. Okay. Yeah, it's a secondary issue. The first, the, the real issue is to find out the genetics, uh, find out the toxic load. Mm -hmm. And you can never really be sure of the entire toxic load because there's so many things. Right. People ask me, well, what are the triggers? I go, well, let's life. look at life. 
shall we? Uh, let's look not only at life, but let's look at your ancestors two or three generations before you were born. And then let's start there. And then you start to work through these patternings and you start to see all these, as we call, as we discussed, in, you know, antecedents, triggers, and mediators or what creates this cascade of toxic burden that then leads to the mitochondrial uh, voltage change and cell membrane change and then going into this inflammatory stuck response that they can't get out of. Okay. Robert Nabo's great intervention, great contribution to the, the world of understanding complex illness was saying, you can't just remove the, the, the trigger or triggers of which there are many, mental and physical. You've got to input into the repair process the right signaling molecules mm -hmm. in order to go from this inflammatory stuck phase to this repair phase to this where the cells, as they start to communicate with each other in the right way through mitochondrial facilitation, which is Jack Cruz's work with light and all that, plus other things, as they start to communicate and they start to talk to each other, you generally move through this healing response and then you come out where you go back to what he calls the health cycle. And it's about a six month to a year process. It's not quick. And you've got to address as many determinants as you can. And it's quite complicated because everybody is uniquely different. And this one may have a DAO enzyme problem, which means you don't break down histamine in the, in the bloodstream. Or they may have an HNMT problems, meaning they don't break down intracellular histamine. Or they may have an MTHFR gene, which means they don't methylate properly. And so everybody's unique and you're always playing, you know, you've got like, you right. feel like you've got a thousand balls in the air and you've got to try your best. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge algorithm to sort of contend with. It's not simple. Right. No, no, no. We, we have seen it. So ever since yeah. seeing that when the diet doesn't move the needle enough to full health, yeah. and now we've been looking into environmental illnesses and just yeah. toxic burden yeah. It's what once we're like, okay, we finally figured out this thing. Yeah. It's never that thing alone. And so yeah. from my understanding with you right now, it's that something or many things trigger the cell danger response. And then yeah. it, the goal then is when you're in that free stuck phase where your body is just trying to protect you and it's almost dissociating from the world just yeah. to yeah. survive. Yeah. The goal okay. is to figure out for that individual what is making them stuck and helping them to get out of that stuck phase so that they yeah. can start going back to healing. And some of it might be light. Some of it might be nourishment. Some of it might be enzymes missing uh, trauma because trauma affects the nervous system, which then releases your hormones, even your thyroid stuff. So beyond right. that, then, um, so I think we understand the lay of the land. Everyone's root cause individuality will be affected. I think diet plays a huge role in just trying to modulate the immune system, just reducing the toxic load a little bit. But well, diet, I find diet, it depends, you know, different genetic uh, people with different gene problems, you have different people, uh, people respond differently to the diet intervention. Okay. So when I when I con when I work with complex patients, um, I know that you uh, I don't know where you are with the carnivore per se, mm -hmm. but I work with I work with all the mitochondrial repair through um, physics. I, I work okay. very strong with physics and Jack Cruz's work and uh, Moore Eddy and those people are very 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 much so. That's the bound the, the the first thing we put in place. Get okay. up with the early morning sunrise. Go to bed. Uh, when you go inside, watch your white light, watch your blue light, and at night go into darkness with mm -hmm. red lamps if you have to. Number one, I don't even budge with that anymore. That's just okay. like fundamental. Number two is diet. And the diet that I have come to feel, I mean, I use, you, you've got to know all your diets, as you know, paleo, paleo autoimmune, low histamine, low oxalates, low sulfates, low <laughs> Right. Maps. You got to know the you know know the sure, territory sure. backwards. Otherwise, you'll never get anywhere. I've sort of hit upon, and you may have. I mean, this is your domain, but I've hit upon the Paleolithic ketogenic diet as the least inflammatory for now. I may change in six months. Sure, sure. And that's a protein, fat, two to one thing, and you know. Yeah, so I definitely think ketogenic diets, um, just that if you're producing ketones and able to use a different form of energy other than glucose, so fatty acids and ketones help when your mitochondrial stuck, if you're trying a different form of energy can help. And then proteins, just having 
protein. good amino acids to even build the building blocks and mm-hmm. meat being the most absorbable when your gut is messed up from a lot of the MCAS mm-hmm. or any environmental illness, then if you have a lot of those, if you just make it easier for the body to get good nutrients without a lot of the toxin load from, even if you get organic plants, they might be next to a farm yeah. that's spraying GMO and exactly. it, it's not really regulated. Um, some people have issues with nuts and seeds. And so it really depends for us. What we do is we start with carnivore really strict. And yeah. then if they can't tolerate that well, um, for whatever reason, maybe they have histamine sensitivities to aged meat or, and, or what we're calling histamines. And so then we try to, by, by the way, Judy, I don't, want, I don't want to interject, but I had a patient who solved that meat issue. He went to the farm and he got them to butcher the cow. And then I think they have to cool it and then freeze it. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. There's not right. a lot of farms that do that, but yes, that's so the, what we. We got one in Calgary now is doing oh, that. Oh, okay. For all our oh, that's amazing. Stuff. Yeah, that is a, that. I only found that out this week. So this oh, is interesting. New. Okay, yes. Yeah, so what we found is the best bet is if they process the animal and then very shortly, without hanging it for too long, put it, yeah. freeze it. And then yeah. the person just eats from the freezer and then does not eat leftovers or anything like that. That's, That's right. the best bet. And then, no so for our practice, what we found is the best for these chronically ill, super sensitive, but bucket is very filled with toxins. Yeah. It's whatever, starting with carnivore ketogenic, and then figuring out what helps you have the lowest amount of immune responses. And that's exactly. the diet we go after. Okay. That's right. And I follow that now too. I mean, I do all the food testing. People say the food testing is irrelevant. I find it highly relevant. Oh, do you? I look okay. at all the gut. Oh, yeah, I find it highly relevant because it tells me about permeability issues. And then I look at all the DAO and the histamine levels because right, some right. people are high, you know, the overmethylators, some are undermethylators. I look for zonulin. Mm-hmm. I look for yes. uh, I look for um, bacterial endotoxemia. I look at the ecology of the gut bacteria. I find those food and stool tests extremely elementary to try to figure stuff out. Yeah, no, I I think the stool tests are good. Where I think the food tests for me get tricky is now that they're hybridizing a lot of foods where they might pull a gene from a fish to put in the strawberry so the strawberry doesn't freeze. You don't know, do you have the strawberry sensitivity or the, so that's where it just gets really weird and nuanced. Or if you haven't had gluten for five years and then you're testing, are you sure you're not sensitive to gluten? So that's where it gets, but I agree. I think a lot of the stool tests can be very beneficial with a lot of the what's the status of I think of it as the physical of your gut. And I see yeah. I think it's very but it's I mean, definitely a lot more beneficial than colonoscopies. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always get the colonoscopy and the endoscopies, because they do biopsy and look at look okay. aside, they look at uh, CD1. Oh, so I work closely with gastroenterologists, okay. because I rely on them for the macroscopic, mm-hmm. you know, architecture of the cell. Sure, sure. Right? And if they say there's lymphocytic colitis and the kelp protectin is 500, you can't get very far with that yeah. patient until you figure that one out and treat it, you know? That's very fair. Yeah, that's yeah. where um, when, I know we're going on tangents, but um, when they say SIRS and the low MSH causes leaky gut, I don't think it's there for you don't have to treat the gut without until you, so I don't, I don't buy that. I think you have to treat the gut. So, so with histamines uh, or MCAS, um, now that we know that it's not always histamines, but if it's MCAS, histamines, whatever mediator, what's the relationship with um, methylation? Well, methylation is the process by which you fix and repair everything, mm-hmm. right? So, and there's many genes involved, you know, but particularly the genes that seem to play the biggest role in MCAS or, or histamine in problems. The MTHFR, so MTHFR is going to do folate metabolism right. and then it's going to combine with B12 and zinc to get to the thionine and then SAMe. And SAMe is a cofactor in the HNMT gene. Mm-hmm. So you want to look at MTHFR, you want to look at HNMT gene, and then you want to look at the DAO gene. And then you look at the CBS gene to see if you're breaking down sulfates up or, or down regulate. Okay. So there's a whole complex mechanism by which methylation plays a role with MCAS. If people have MTHFR problems, they may be having problems with making SAMe, which is a cofactor mm-hmm. for uh, HNMT. They may not be breaking down histamine intracellularly, right? And then also methylation helps. I mean, they say 70% of SAMe and methylation is to making phospholipids. Okay. And phospholipids repair the cell membrane. And 
histamine loves to go through the cell membrane and trigger calcium. Calcium then becomes an NMDA receptor, glutamate receptor, which is pro-inflammatory. So there's a whole link with phospholipids, SAMe, homocysteine, uh, CBS mutations, uh, DAO mutations. They all sort of play a role. Yeah. So then we often will test homocysteine and we see that they're probably not methylating properly. So then we will recommend a methylated folate, but that's obviously like more of a Band-Aid in the situation where someone has the MTHFR gene, what are your sometimes next steps of what you would do if they are suffering from histamines? Or well, I, I would I would use William Walsh's work with under or over methylation okay. to see if high or low methylators to see if they got high levels of histamine or low mm -hmm. levels of histamine on their blood tests. I do look at DAO genes, and if if they are over methylated, you treat them in a very different way than if they under methylated. There's different approaches. William Walsh's work goes into that in great William detail. William Walsh, okay. Okay, I'll yeah. have to take a look at that. And then now, what about... Nutrient power is very... And his courses are superb. Yeah. Okay. And then what about histamines, MCAS with sulfur? Um... Yeah, so that's an interesting problem. I mean, the sulfur issue, sulfur goes to sulfate. Right. And that gene is controlled by molybdenum. And molybdenum right. is robbed by... Glyphosate. As and you copper. <laughs> and so, you know, with people, if you look at the urine excretion of glyphosate, it could be through the roof. Mm -hmm. If we do the IGL test from Germany and we see glyphosates in the very high zone, we know that they probably got a molybdenum deficiency. Uh, probably, not always, but probably. Right. And uh, then we have to sort of start thinking, well, is this a mast cell histamine issue? Is this a oxalate issue? Is it a sulfite issue? Is it a salicylate issue? And you often get very confused because people are, you know, a lot of patients are very astute. They will tell you, they'll say, oh, when I do this and I get high levels of that and I get smell sulfur and I can smell ammonia, then you start thinking of hydrogen sulfide, SIBO, yes. start thinking of ammonia. But a lot of patients know this stuff and they kind of, they read a lot and then, they, but they often draw conclusions that not necessarily yes. uh, pan out in the long term. So you've got to really make your way through that complexity. It takes a lot of work to sit and figure stuff out. And you've got to get feedback from patients as to what happened when you did this and didn't do that. I mean, some of the some of the medications we use interfere with some of the enzymes that, mm -hmm. that are necessary, like DAO. Benadryl may block the DAO enzyme, which is not what you want. You know? So what I'm hearing from you is whether you're a methylator, obviously you have to determine if you're under or over, but yeah. whether it's methylation, whether it's sulfur intolerance or sensitivities or not breaking down right, or that you have glyphosate or that it's a molybdenum issue, you just have to figure out per individual. It's the, there is no one size fits all answer in figuring out if these are some of possible clues or like one more layer to the onion of their unwellness um is is that correct yeah well so so you know patients will often come in with uh 500 hours of google searching and 10 support groups and <laughs> they they all have opinions as to what's causing the illness and they often for go down the rabbit hole 10 times more than you do you know so i tend to listen to what they're saying try and see if it correlates with my experience but i always try and move to a thousand foot view and try and treat the complexity of the multiple systems okay. without going down the sulfur pathway too astutely or down sure. the i mean i do pay attention but right, often right. people when they regulate the amygdala and they regulate the vagus tone and they regulate sympathetic overdrive and they work with their coherence and they work with regular a lot of these things just drift away they just right. fall away. yeah so i try not to go straight <laughs> thousand foot down the rabbit hole and figure out genes and biochemistry yeah um, i i agree with that so we'll we'll have people that start carnivore they feel better and maybe they don't move the needle enough and then they start wondering well what else is it and then you go on social media or the internet and there's always a new illness that's the new fad this is the reason really? why everyone's sick and so then they go down that rabbit hole, like you said, it's really, really deep. And it makes sense logically, because a lot of the symptoms always, they all meld together a little bit. Um, and, and so you think, oh, maybe this is it because I haven't tried, but ultimately the client or patient is telling you, 
I don't feel well and I'm desperate to get better. So if this is the next thing, I'm willing to try it because ultimately I just want to get better. And what we find, like you say, is if we take a more holistic view, we yeah. actually find that the bigger gap that, that you brought up is that vagal tone, the a trauma response is huge in a sense of if you have childhood wounds and your response to the world is always a fight or flight, and then you're releasing constant cortisol, or you have a brain um, injury or trauma response there, your response to the world is release. It's like you're, you're fighting the world all the time. And I don't know if it's because it's such hard work, but that part of it, I feel there is more uh, resistance from people of wanting to do that hard work than to say, I'll just try the light therapy or I'll just try this supplement or that path or that diet. It's, it's much harder for them to believe in the mind body work because either they think it's woo woo. I've already, um, time has healed my wounds, but as we have our own mind body group, now we have noticed it took them to take the course to finally understand. I now understand the connection of how it affects me from healing. And I don't think people fully get that, but maybe if you could touch upon how important is it that we even regulate the nervous system, the tone, the nervous system. It's uh, it, to me, it's the elephant in the room, which yeah. is not well taught and not well addressed. Now, as you know, as you become more experienced as a practitioner, you get more certain about certain things. Hopefully not without too much hubris and arrogance, but you just kind of know sure. certain things that just you've got to get right. Otherwise, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And just by way of illustration, I had a patient come to see me yesterday who she came to see me nine months ago for my cell activation syndrome and mold and sores and everything. Right. And she her symptom was always burning, burning of the skin, trying hundreds of mast cell blockers and doing phospholipid restoration, cell memory, and it never budged. So first thing that you know as a practitioner, if you're working hard on a biochemical problem and you can't break it, you're probably working at the wrong level. Right. That's probably true. <laughs> and you got to go up into, you know, physics and into emotion, and into mental field and into ancestral fields to find the solution. But this patient came back to me yesterday and she said, and I'm not going to divulge because of privacy, but yes. she came and told me what that symptom was. And it was got nothing to do with my cell or mold or anything. It had everything to do with early developmental issues. And she, working with somatic experiencing practitioners, DNRS, or they don't use DNRS, they're all using primal trust now. Mm -hmm. And then doing self-regulation through M-Wave and brain tap and mind lift. Reading and, and yes. And safe and sound, we do all yeah. of that. That emerged from her own inner exploration. She got that symptom was related to that event, and she put two and two together, and the symptom disappeared. Nine months of working with my cell blockers and saying, No, I can't take this. Chromalin makes me crazy. And and you go round and round. And then, but I always said to her, I said to her, I your burning isn't a my cell problem. I know that, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> she went home and she came back and told me what it was. That's fascinating. So I feel like just having a clinical practice where you yeah. just start to see trends where anything that you have a belief in that you're, if you think, for example, that diet fixes everything until you have a practice that all your patients say otherwise, that it doesn't always fix everything. It can improve, but not always. I and wish I had a practice that's just diet based. <laughs> no, I, I, that's what I wanted until I realized that's not what fixes everything. And so we had to um, expand. And so we then see that, like you said, with that one person, we noticed that everything we we've used all the tools that we generally use on people with SIRS, Lyme, chronic illness, environmental illness, diet, and you're still not moving the needle. And that's when I think at a certain point, then it's not, those are not the modalities. And so we always ask, have you ever had childhood trauma? Have you ever had negative really traumatic experiences happen to you. And some of the the ones that we've been shared, um, they're pretty traumatic. And some of them say just time has healed it. But I, I think it goes back to that one book where the body it's keeps usually, the score. Usually right? not the case. I mean, yeah. people have early trauma, time doesn't heal it. It just goes on. No, I know that. Unconscious and they shut it down. And they, they all have anxiety. What's anxiety? Anxiety is a defense against mm -hmm. feeling whatever happened back then. Right. 
it's not a it's not an emotion it's a defense against feeling the shame the guilt the anger the rage the murderous rage that can occur from sex abuse or being mm -hmm. beaten by father or whatever it was you know not protected by mother so we have a very strict criteria to looking at family systems and early trauma it's like i go there first it makes sense no i think it makes sense we we never wanted to create a mind body program until yeah. like you're saying as a practitioner it was a constant thing of uh -huh. oh you need mind body work it's not just talk therapy i think it's people think a lot of talk mind therapy body is, work <laughs> talk therapy doesn't work okay just get rid of that one i mean it's nice for the hour they in the you know telling their problems that You've got to go to the unconscious. You've got to work at the hidden dynamics. You've got right. to look at the entanglements of the system. Mm -hmm. And they are unconscious. Right. They're not conscious. And you've got to unravel them. And you've got to, you've got to be... I use I use family constellation work. I work okay. with Mark yeah. Roland, who's just an expert at it. He can unravel. He can look at dynamics and pick them out in two hours. Da, 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 mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Then he gives them a diagnostic map. That's number one. Okay. Then they take those insights, and then they work with... You know, different practitioners. There's different. We use different people. We use uh, somatic experiencing yes. practitioners. We use internal family systems. Mm -hmm. We use ISTDP. Or we use Jungian psychoanalysis. We use different modalities depending yes. on the age and experience of the patient and how defended they are or how open they are. Right. And then we use. Then we look at their brains. We look at their. We do QEGs on everybody right. and heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. We look at their stress response. We look at their brain waves. We see if they're stuck in beta, if they've got high theta, if they got, you know, whatever. Because you're meant to resonate with Schumann's resonance in the eight, you know, eight to 12 hertz. If your brain's not resonating at that frequency right. because you've got too much trauma and stress and you're, you're sleeping in, you know, with electrical fields behind your bed and your routers under your pillow. I mean, there's, there's no way that person is budging. <laughs> right, right. No, and so, so then, in our mind-body therapy, we try to um, at least have them understand. So we talk about, we touch all the things you've mentioned, but more of the educational, here are some modalities you can use. But yeah. if you know that one thing is where you're stuck, you may want to pursue that even further in like one-on-one -on -one, um, support. So I think- it, I, find, I find it essential that people yeah. they take up with the relevant practitioner. And sometimes they got to search for somebody that knows, that can unlock some of the keys. You know, sometimes they just don't resonate with practitioners and they just- they... Right. It's, it's a human connection. If you don't connect- so we had one person in our mind body group that basically said, I don't believe in any of this woo woo stuff. I'm really skeptical, but I'm really, really unwell. And then over a course of three weeks that we did the family part or uh, we did core wounds, family relationships, personal dynamics, uh, the way we communicate languages of love, all of that was included in that section. And it finally clicked. It finally clicked like, oh, I get now why I'm in this trauma state and i'm just living in a trauma response but it yeah. it just took the right language because it's not like a lot of the stuff we shared wasn't it wasn't rocket science it was just it just sometimes takes maybe a certain amount of messaging or the way you say it that they finally are willing to listen you've Go got ahead. to i found one has to take the history oh yeah and you've got to find out the uh entanglements of the family system mm -hmm. mother to her mother mother to child, father to child, father to his father, cultural issues, early right. developmental issues. You've got to take the history to find the entanglements. You can't just sit, throw a whole bunch of techniques at them and say, just try these. Right, You've right. got to know what's cooking with that patient. What happened? What was the original trauma that led them to be defended and develop symptomatology consequence to that? And what's keeping them locked in that state? Because you know, Porges, as you know, the ventral vagal above the right. face, that's where they establish co-regulation with mother, limbic resonance. And if right. mother isn't there, dad's not there, mother's fighting with father, that child lives in a state of hyperadrenergic hyperarousal for 10, 20 years. And that resets the HPA axis and causes the gut permeability, which causes this, you know, the, the, the bacterial endotoxemia, which causes the chronic neuroinflammation, which shuts down the mitochondrial membrane. And once people get the link and yeah. they see how, oh, that's where it started. Right. That's how it perpetuated. This is what I'm dealing with now. I don't have trust. I cannot self-regulate. And so we always start with insight, self-regulation strategies, 
Mm. And patients who come from afar now, we get them to, you know, learn how to do coherent training. And then we have them sit in their chairs. We have them in coherence. We then introduce Marcel intravenous blockade. Okay. If they're Marcel activated, we use Ativan. We are not afraid of okay. Ativan. I don't have this boogie thing that you take 500 years to get it out of your system. I don't believe that. Um, we use Ativan. It's a mast cell blocker and it, stay, it cools off the amygdala. And most of these yeah. people are so amygdala upregulated. They can't even, they think of a treatment and they, they you know, they come with two foods and five. Right. They can't even take supplement. Right. So you've got to cool them down, get them in coherence, do mast cell blockade with Ativan, Benadryl, uh, Toradol, a Dancitron, these block some of the some of the mast cell mediators mm -hmm. that are flying everywhere. And then while they're in mast cell sort of calm down, then we get them to take their first H1 blocker, levosotirazine, because they're all afraid of everything. Why? Because they're afraid of life. Their parents didn't give them safety. The ventral vagus safety switch was never activated. There was no limbic resonance in creating a sense of self over 10, 20, 30 years, which is needed to develop prefrontal cortices where you can regulate yourself without impulse right. control. And, and that's a very big process. That, that's a muscle that has to be trained. You know, neuroplasticity and salience are huge. And if they don't get that piece, I can't work with them. I, just, I, I can try all the muscle blockers in the world. I can try the fats and the lipids and right. the, it just doesn't toll. They've got to learn to self-regulate. Yeah. Let me add to what you just said so that it makes it clear because from everything you said, it's like, well, what does that have to do with digestion or my gut permeability? But if our HPA access is disturbed, that's where we might be in a fight or flight, or we just don't know how to respond. We might be outputting therefore more cortisol from that. I mean, anything that your brain per perceives as a fear or a threat releases yeah. hormones. And then yeah. that is also where our, our thyroid can get affected by the pituitary giving misinformation in terms of when to release uh, TSH, for example. And then when you're in a fight or flight response, your body is in the mindset of you just need to run. So all the blood and all the energy goes towards your limbs to run. And so therefore, then it purposely shuts down the gut because it's assuming you're not going to eat. So if you're yeah. constantly in that state, but you're actually not running, your gut shuts down. So then imagine you're eating, it's not digesting well, there's not enough enzymes going to your gut and the blood to actually break down and assimilate your nutrients. And so exactly. therefore, when you're in that constant stress state, because of something that may have happened in your childhood, that you're not aware of any of this happening, it could, that's where if you've had constant gut issues your whole life, it could actually be stemming from something that happened or didn't happen in your childhood it almost then... always is right. almost always 100 <laughs> okay. percent. well i just need to make the connection because i think a lot of people hear all the things but they we don't see the connection as well and that's why i do like talking to you because you see it from this ten thousand foot view of how everything is so interrelated and when we're in the wellness space we think okay i'm just gonna focus on light but don't see the intricacies of how our heart has electromagnetic, you know, it has the volt. I saw your post recently, so I'm sure. <laughs> you got it. The heart, the heart and the prefrontal cortex are together. The amygdala and the gut are together. So when you've got a fear-based response, your neurohormones, your neurotransmitters, your neuropeptides, they are always, you know, if you don't eat according to your circadian clock, if you don't eat moderately the right foods for your physiology, according to the season, and you're just seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, which the amygdala wants to do, you're going to have disruption in your gut-brain axis. And often that stems from, um, it stems from early deve developmental issues where the trust was not established with mother, uh, mother and child, where the limbic resonance and sense of self with the hormones of the ventral vagus, which is serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, all the feel-good hormones are regulated through ventral vagus safety and trust. No, they down into all the, you know, substance P and all the inflammatory, norepinephrine and all the inflammatory neurotransmitters. They keep them in a state of sympathetic fight-flight, which then, as you just described, it causes gut permeability, and then the food gets through and then triggers antibody production against the thyroid against all the brain proteins i mean you do a neural zoomer and you'll see people with chronic trauma they've got like 
15 antibodies attacking myelin and dopamine and everything. Yeah, they've got leaky brains, leaky mitochondria, leaky guts. Right. Everything's leaky. Yeah, they of often say that like diabetic blood is often diabetic brain or, you know, leaky gut is leaky brain as well. So, you know, the a lot of the people that suffer with MCAS may have Lyme or may have SIRS or mold. I mean, how do you start treating? Do you first start treating the MCAS before you treat the, I guess, bigger environmental illnesses? How do you go about or does it depend? Uh, it, it depends a lot on the person. But when people come and see me and tell me what's wrong with them, immediately I stop listening. And then I try and take a history and try and listen. Gotcha. And often what they think is wrong with them at the end of two hours, they once I've reframed everything, they go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they come with, I got Lyme, I got mycel, I got mold. I got, and they may have all those. Right. It's not saying that they're not right. But they've hyper-focused on that as being everything. So you've got to sort of break that apart. You've got to break mm -hmm. that mindset. It's not that. It's just, you know, that may have been the trigger that broke the camel's back. And then you've got to try and figure out what on earth did happen in this person's life from birth to now. And you've got to take that timeline. And then once you start doing it that way, you sort of get an idea. Now, Lyme disease... Is a big trigger, of course, but I don't touch Lyme disease. I look at it. I look at the antibody. But if they have Lyme, unless it's very up, or they have recently, most of them have late Lyme or chronic Lyme. Right, right. Artonella. I you can't you can't get them out of the cell danger response by going after the Lyme. Yeah, I there's no way. Try. Don't even. And I, also mold. I mean, this whole I see everybody now is mold, 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 but. And I'm very cautious about that because, you know, mold, yeah, it's an incredible, it, it, you know, it activates all the cytokines that destroy MSH, which lack of light does as well, by the way. And then it, you know, the gut and all the hormones and the mitochondria, sure. But you've got to, you've got to reinstitute lifestyle practices that reestablish safety. You've got to work with the ventral vagus, uh, the safety of that patient. You've got to work on it over and over again. Then the system starts to relax and starts to communicate. Then you can go, I don't detoxify mold anymore. Occasionally I use mm -hmm. cholestyramine after six months to mop up. But yeah. don't touch cholestyramine in the beginning. You'll crash that patient, particularly if they're lipid depleted. Right, right. What's yeah. interesting, though, is we struggle with this a lot in our practice because there are people that have mental health diagnoses such as bipolar or depression or mania, but it's actually that their brain is leaky and that some of the biotoxins from either mold, water damage buildings is affecting their ability to process or regulate. Now, some of it absolutely is the mind body, but there there's like two things at the same time. So even if somebody does the mind body work, without taking care of the biotoxins that might be infiltrating the brain, we notice, or some type of toxins, we notice that they don't get the full healing with just the mind body. And then no, just, of course not. Of course not. So no. then how do you, like, how do you do the magical? <laughs> I always work in layers and levels. Okay, okay. Times, I got my seven levels in my head and thinking, well, what level and what layer, what are we dealing with now? Gotcha. And I always jump layers. Like I'll go, Okay, we worked on this, we worked on mold, but they still, then I go, well, you know, what about light? What time are they getting up in the morning? Are they looking at the sun? How much white light are they getting? How much blue light are they getting? Are they getting four hours of dark at night? I always start, and now, now I've shifted a lot to the whole electromagnetic and okay. physics of healing. I've, I've always known about it and I sort of fiddled with it, but now I'm like, no. no. Have you seen a lot of, a lot more improvement with the light. Mm. Okay. Two weeks doesn't take forever. So is it just a new protocol in terms of protecting yourself against certain lights that um, just, no, no, no. It, it, it's you, you, the mitochondria, the mitochondria activity and health depends on the cohesion of water and mm. electrons and protons. Right. Right. And as Jack Cruz talks endlessly on multiple podcasts, it's everything to do with the f getting exposed to the full photoelectric effect, the full electromagnetic frequency of the sun. We are meant to be in the sun. We're not meant to be living where I am right now, where there's snow over there uh, and six months of darkness. It's just not humanly, you know, physiologically um, 
helpful. Mm -hmm. So early morning sun, watch the sun rise. That's when most of the spectrum is initiated. That then initiates the dopamine, the melatonin, the palm C, the endorphins that then stay throughout the day. And then at night, when you go dark, you then, uh, by the way, it works through the suprachiasmic nucleus and, uh, you know, many other pathways, which con the master clock, which controls all the other physiological processes in the body. So if you get exposure to light, you activate that pathway. Okay. And then you've got, you've got to like at night, you've got to go four hours of darkness to go shift from dark, from light to dark, so that the detox mechanisms and your body's restorative clocks can all click in and sync. But if you don't get light exposure, in other words, if you don't live on the equator or 20 degrees up and down, and you don't get early morning light, and you come indoors and you're in front of blue light and white LED light, you completely shut down mitochondrial repair. It just is a toxin. It's junk food, junk light. Same effect. You talk about junk food, junk light is more damaging than junk food. And then you want to be in dark at night without the LED and the blue light and the TV. And then you got to switch off your router. You know, router is, you know, it's 2.4 gigahertz. It's a microwave right. under your bedroom. Same as your cell phone. Your cell phone is a microwave, oven. And then you've also got your electrical current behind your bed when you sleep, the 60 AC current. Mm -hmm. Your brain is repairs at eight down to zero hertz. You've got 60 hertz going six feet from your bed where the two lights are onto your body. Worse if you've got a metal frame bed and worse if you've got box spring mattress. And so your brain's in a constant state of sympathetic overdrive. You can't mm -hmm. You can't activate your detox pathways at night through the glymphatic system. You just stay in, stay in a state of inflammation and chronic stress. So the, the light piece, I think, is a, it's sort of, I mean, I wrote in a chapter of my book 10 years ago on it, but I never really sort of, I mean, I fiddled with it, wrote blogs in it, but now I'm, now I'm just, do that first and then we'll talk. And, and you two, see ju just that change alone without yeah. environment, diet, you're saying it makes that big of a it makes a huge difference. Okay. It's not the only one, like it's a level, sure. but, but if that's the primary level. You've got to put that in for the health cycle to reestablish itself and for the mitochondria to get electrons and protons in order to make the ATP, to generate the energy, to fix everything else. Then food. Right. So in our practice, uh, we obviously say to follow the, like wake up with the uh, sun and then have the light in your eyes and, and focus on that as a, just a natural priority of this, how the, we humans have lived for so long, but we haven't really focused on. And I think partially it's because a lot of the people that already come to us wear you know, the glasses and stuff, but we don't focus primarily as light first. And even without that, we see the needle move. And so then my thought, my just logical thought always is, if we don't say you have to turn off all the routers, you have to be careful of all EMFs and certain lights and turn off this and that. And we still see so much healing and in individuals that are compromised, then is it only a subset that gets affected by this because so many other people seem to be okay without focusing on this light lever? Just talk, just go read all of uh, Jack Cru Cruz's podcasts and start doing it like militantly and mm -hmm. seeing if you can get another 10% better. Okay. I'll take a look. People with mast cell activation are often worse because the uh, EMFs trigger histamine, and uh, which crosses through the cell membrane and triggers, as I said, you know, glutamate and all the excitatory neurotoxins. Yeah, we do see people with EMF sensitivities where they can't. So we do a lot of our paperwork online. So we have to mail them the paperwork because they can't be near any screens. So we absolutely yeah. see that. We do see a correlation with SIRS. I wonder if that person would have been better also doing some of the light therapy as well. So yeah, I, I would really pull that one up and make it a central theme of your practice. I mean, I don't want to tell you, but I, I have, and um, having paid lip service and now I'm like, just, I mean, now it's like, please do this. Otherwise we can't go to the next level. Okay. I'll have to. So what we always typically do in our practice or what we typically do in our practice is any new supplement or theory or protocol. We always try it with a, 
you know, we just do like a clinical practice run. And then if we see efficacy, we just launch it with a few more people and then we'll go public with it. So we'll, we'll see, because the beauty is we run, we work with one-on-one people. So it's very easy for us to do our own clinical trials in a sense. So yeah, thank you for that. We obviously talked about a lot of different things and it's hard to say where to start. It sounds like for you, you're saying start with light, then nutrition, and then maybe looking back at some of the well, start with the history. Right. I mean, yeah, yes. Assuming that we got the history. but Yeah, because sometimes in the history is like that. I, uh, that is where I'm going. <laughs> and it could be on early developmental trauma. You go there first. There's not many doctors who, I mean, I'll just say this objectively. I hope it doesn't sound like hubris. But I, 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 for some reason, just got interested in the human condition at a young age. And so I've studied all layers and levels. And so I use it practically and I have a model for it. It's not common practice. Oh, I know. We work with a lot of doctors, I know. It's not common practice. And you'll get little, you get the Marcel and you get the lime and you get the more. And it's not wrong. I'm, right, I'm, right, everybody's right. Everybody's doing their best to help everybody. And But I just found if I don't work in those layers and levels and use that front and center, uh, and I still get stuck. I mean, of course. Yeah, and then, yeah. yeah. But if I don't use that those layers and levels, um, I uh, get I get stuck much quicker. Right. I, th- I think the way that I explain it to some of our clients is um, depending on which doctor you go to, they're going to have a certain hammer and then every nail looks like that perfect hammers fit. And what you really need is multiple hammers and using thinking. And you have yeah. to use a lot of thinking and knowing what to ask and even understanding the person in front of you and what they're like you said, what you're saying, it's I know they're saying they need X, but what do they really need? And that's also like, you can't take everything that the person is telling you to be, that's what I need to go after, because I know that that's what they think. But sometimes um, just having the experience of clinical practice, you know, that it's actually a few more layers up that they're missing. And they're just talking about a symptom. And I don't think all doctors or all practitioners see the multiple hammers. They really, because, you know, the thought is you just become a specialist. You become a specialist in one hammer. And the thing is, then everything looks like the, the, the nail for that hammer. And it's not right. It's, it's my biggest <laughs> uh, challenge is when people come from other very good practitioners and they say, I got SIRS, I got Lyme, I got... And then you have to deconstruct a lot of that and then put it in a bigger context. And I don't know if you ever saw the lecture I did at ICI about two years or three years ago, where I explained the seven levels of healing and okay. the seven one of the slides of about the four, uh, maybe 20 is when I integrate Ken Wilber's insight. It's not, it's not, it's not what, how many tools you've got in your toolbox. It's the holder of the toolbox. Right. That's right. the magical ingredient. How many layers and levels of healing is that person experienced with? What do they know about early trauma? What do they know about inherited trauma? What do they know about brain health? What do they know about, um, you know, toxicology and biochemistry and, you know, how, what layers and levels are they bringing to the table? It's the holder of the tuba. And that is a new medical education. Really? Okay. It requires a whole new education. Right. No, right. And when I stop doing clinical work, all I'm going to do is treat, help other practitioners work in a bigger paradigm. No, I love it because... We, we advocate for our clients to basically interview their doctor or interview whoever they're going to, I guess, get their prescriptions from or get their care from, because if they're only following one protocol, well, what happens when that protocol doesn't work? And oftentimes it doesn't work for everybody. And, or what if the carnivore diet doesn't work all the way, then what? And I, there, it's not that you're not doing it good enough. It's not because you didn't find the right lime herbal or that you didn't find the right home to be in for SIRS all the time. Sometimes it's other things. And I think we need to, as practitioners and doctors, we need to be open to digging for answers. And I know it gets hard because not everyone's a lifelong learner. Not everyone has the time to find other solutions, but I think it's imperative, especially with the chronically ill, especially because of all these new illnesses that come up all the time that we need to be smarter. Like you said, um, at picking which tool to use in the toolbox and then making sure the toolbox has sufficient tools. And I think that's a disservice that so many practitioners do not do, unfortunately. Well, it, 
Our medical training doesn't even begin. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, uh, many practitioners do a very good job with what they know, and oh, they will refer on when they've reached their limits. Um, very seldom do you find practitioners just keep treating along that same pathway without making progress. So, you know, sure. and everybody's doing their best. Um, right, right. And I always find that, you know, we know that when you start healing at the higher levels of the of the individual, those effects trickle down to biochemistry. Mm -hmm. But when you treat the serves, it doesn't trickle up. You know, you can't treat the body and the toxicology and have a have your uh, internal dialogue and your thoughts and your mental field uh, changed. And that's often, that's what often produces the symptomatology is that 60,000 thoughts you have thoughts. every day create yeah. a whole generation of cascading, you know, uh, psychoneuroimmunological consequences along multiple axes. <laughs> and it's often the, the content of the thought and the way people are defended against full expression and, the absence of the ventral vagal safety and self-regulation that leads to the physical symptomatology. It's always, it's almost always in my practice somewhere up there. Yeah. I think that makes so much sense. We, uh, we've been treating SIRS now for three years. And in that time, there are people that get really stuck. And that's the only reason we created this mind body because certain other programs out there were missing like DNRS doesn't have somatic, for example, it doesn't have the family entanglement as an example. We noticed, oh, you actually are suffering from a lot of trauma and we need you to understand that because no amount of treatment. I really think there's a lot of people that probably have undiagnosed SIRS or undiagnosed something, but their immune system isn't bad enough to make them super sick. But it's just, but there's a subset that do get sick that does turn on very quickly or does turn on with COVID. And why is that? And I think a lot of it, like you said, it's that initial family childhood core wounds and these traumas that have happened in their life that now triggers them to just make their immune system more dampened. So their toxic load becomes much more quickly overburdened. Yeah. And causes, you know, all sorts of dysautonomias. The, the, oh, right. Like, right. This is the great elephant in the room every, you know half the people got pots and undiagnosed yes. yeah. and then a lot of people have hypermobility undiagnosed and that causes all these proteases to like damage the, your connective tissue right and then then that releases mast cells as you stretch your tissue you've got mast cell activation and then that causes dysautonomia and so you get these triads and pentans of symptom presentation in this complex you know and you've got to try and figure out where do you begin in all this it's like a minefield we, we have questions in our uh, questionnaire like your dad give me five words to describe your dad oh interesting give me five words to describe your mother what was your relationship like with your family growing up were you hyper vigilant were you seen were you abused and then we start to put pieces together if they say i hate my father i haven't spoken to him in 10 years my mother's borderline uh she's a mess game over right there's you don't go anywhere. You, yeah. That's where you go. Because that person, because as we discussed before, that person's half their father, half their mother. They've now separated from both the masculine and feminine influences in their life, and they're creating a complete HPA access stress response. That is no way you're going to heal that without doing inner work. If you are upset about your father for whatever things, you have the DNA of that person, and it will impact, maybe, maybe unknowingly it's making you angry at yourself for certain things that are like your dad. And so anger turn inwards, but I, but very often they gave to you what they got from their parent. So you've got to say yes to your parents, no matter what you got or didn't get, you've got to say, you've got to start see how did my father's behavior with all of his problems? Sure. You've got to say how, how did it serve me? How do I have that same trait? How did he have the other trait? Cause not pe everybody's got every trait. So they may express this or express that, but they got the other side. And then they've got to say, how can I say yes to my father for giving me that experience? How did it serve who I've become? And if they start doing deeper work on mm -hmm. the deconstruction of their, of their judgments, where they're looking for pleasure and trying to avoid pain, which never helps. Right. You've got pleasure pain simultaneously at the same time, always. Right. If they can't deconstruct their mental field and see the order to their life, they can't heal because they're always going to be seeking in, you know, 
pleasures and avoiding pains. And they're going to be stuck in that inflammatory response. I had that trait. My dad was angry and abusive. Okay. A, where was I angry and abusive? There are five people who've seen me be angry and abusive. So that gets rid of the self-righteousness because we have every trait. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Then Fair how enough. does my dad's anger and abusiveness make me who I am today? How did it benefit me in the seven areas of my life? Because mm -hmm. you think that if dad wasn't angry, you would have had a perfect life. It's not true. If dad had been loving and seeing me, how would have it disadvantaged my life? I don't believe you can let go of something you still have a charge against. So if you okay. can't see the benefit to it, you're not going to let it go. Anger serves. I mean, it's not like a negative emotion. It's a, it has, it has a purpose. Yeah. It gets things going it, it mobilizes. It, it gets you doing, gets you realigned with your own purpose. You know, anger is not every, every emotion is neutral until you put your value system on it. You actually not let it go. You actually, you actually say thank you for that experience. Thank you for giving me that experience because I now see a role it played in my benefit. Because here's how it benefited me, and this is how I use it for now. Because when dad was being angry, somebody wasn't being angry. You're never without two sides. Mm -hmm. Mother was probably overprotective. Dad was probably underprotective. Demartini is the guy who developed this cognitive thing. So everything is love in the universe. Everything's balanced between electrons and protons, which we know from physics is true. So everything's both balanced, including the emotional uh, and mental field of man. And until you can see the balance of nature, how it serves and, and doesn't serve, if you can, until you can see the balance and see how everything serves, which he calls love, it's the synthesis of all opposites. Until you see love, you can't really let go of any charge you may have judging it positively or negatively. So it's a just a level higher than forgiveness. Sure, sure. Okay, no, I think that's fair. Okay, where can people find you? Um, social media, do you still write um, articles? And then how can people work with you? Um, I still write. I have written a bit less lately, but okay. I still, I, I'm, I'm wanting to write a lot more. I think my website is hoffmancenter.com. I'll put in the show notes. So it's yeah. for sure. Yeah. And there's Instagram and all that. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for your time. I think it's always so helpful because you help us find other lovers to consider when our care is not fully complete and we're still not being well. And I just hate that sometimes we're, we ourselves are not doing the protocol, right? Whether it's a diet, whether it's a treatment, and then we start even furthering self-blame saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not perfect enough. And that's why I'm not getting better. And it's the worst thing to do to this population. So yeah. Uh, and then no, thank you for um thank you for sending the patients that I've seen. They've been fantastic. They're all they're all great patients because they, you know, you've laid the deep foundation for oh, them. Oh, thank you. And they're inquisitive and they open. So it's a, it's it's great to work with them. So thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much again for your time. Okay. All right, Julie. See you. Okay, guys. I hope you enjoyed this interview. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot of difficult discussions and what it can all be. And I think to consider mind body work is so important. It is not because I have a program. We only build things when things don't work. And when we know that other things need to be in place as a tool for us, as we built our practice, our first toolbox was mostly carnivore and an elimination diet that is so powerful. But then we realized people suffer from MCAS and histamines. And there we brought in another tool. Then we saw Lyme and how Lyme can persist even on a carnivore diet or a chronic Lyme. And then that was another part of the toolbox. And then there was long COVID and that was another piece. And then SIRS and mold illness and environmental illness, another tool. And then VOCs that also can be part of SIRS as well. But all in all, we are just building our toolbox because when you have a practice where you work with people one-on-one, -on -one, you start to see where maybe you don't have all the tools in the toolbox to help people, or at least know which tool to use. And for our practice, we, yes, sometimes have to recommend out, especially because of certain instances, but for the most part, we don't say, we don't know the answers and we're going to give up on you because we used to just refer out, but a lot of people would have to come back to us because they still didn't get an answer. So for us, we always commit to trying to find the tools that you may need to find those levers for healing. We may not always have the answers, but at least we are going to try. And that's why we created this mind body because it was a big gap we saw with people healing. There is a trend that we see where people with SIRS, with people with chronic Lyme, 
that they are more sensitive to certain things, including histamines, because they've had a traumatic childhood or a trauma response or something really bad, even a brain injury from a really bad car accident that has now affected that whole vagal nerve, the autonomic nervous system. And then it's figuring out how do we rebalance and no amount of a protocol is going to fix that if the wiring inside your body is not fully rebalanced. It's not just one thing that is going to fix people. For some people, it is just the carnivore diet, helping the gut rest, giving adequate nutrition, and then the immune system can flourish and do its job. For some other people, it requires a lot deeper healing in order to get to root cause healing. But if you're tired of being sick, it is an answer and it is an ability to find a toolbox that is greater than what you've seen to be part of that toolbox. And so I know this can sometimes be overwhelming for certain people, but also know that for the people that are unwell, this is just an opportunity to know that you don't have to be sick forever. All right, guys, make sure you eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.